a co cup of coffee. I always used to do a conservation genetics joke of the day to get, to get people talking. And so uh, th this is one of my favorite ones. This is, uh, yeah, everybody know about the you know, oh, Eastern yeah. Coast of Canada. And they, you know, they really do terrible things to seal. So this uh, seal went into a bar in Halifax. The bartender asked him what he wanted. He said, anything but a Canadian club. <laughs> So there's what Gordon looked like in 1990 in the upper left. Spam. That had to be about 1990, maybe a little bit later. Here's Gordon when he had a position in France. And there's Gordon drinking beer with his father at 9 o'clock in the morning. Lincoln, Nebraska. And we're going to a Husker game. And there's Gordon with his fiance in Glacier Park. <laughs> That's a bit more appropriate for 9 a.m. That was beer. And I know Mike spoke this morning. So you know, Mike comes in many people. You know, Mike. Mike comes in more than two, but that's what Mike looks like. He's near the ocean. This is what Mike looks like in the mountains. And Mike comes in one more phenotype. So this is Mike trying to put a tag on a leopard seal. And so I don't know if you know anything about leopard seals, but they're, they're, they're pretty nasty. So. What happened immediately after that photo? You have to ask Mike. <laughs> he survived, apparently. He said, well, you know, they're kind of slow on land. But. So, Conservation genetics is a combination, I like to think of it as a combination of applying basic science, that is genetics, to problems in, in conservation. And throughout my career, I've always been interested in working this interface between doing basic science at the same time applying it to problems in, in conservation. And I think that some of the, as it says here, some of the more most interesting problems at least in population genetics, also a really important five questions for conservation. And so I started doing this when I was a grad student back in the 1970s in the University of Washington. And so working on steelhead rainbow trout, there's a lot of people that are interested in our results. And so this was my first paper published in the journal of genetics. At the same time, so I was also applying this information to problem, and this was before conservation biology even existed. It was really conservation biology really became a field in the 1980s when there was a number of books that came out and a number of readings. So I like to think of Darwin as the first conservation geneticist, as you might have read if you read, read our book. So this was the book where Darwin talked about his understanding of genetics. So he looked at uh, variation in plants and animals or in agriculture. And my favorite chapter is the one on uh, the good effects of crossing and the evil effects of close interbreeding. And Darwin had a fairly modern view of today what we call inbreeding, but back then it was called interbreeding. And so he talked about trying to apply, so he knew that when you inbred farm animals and farm plants, that there was harmful effects, deleterious effects of, of breed, breeding relatives together. And that was well known for a long time, but Darwin, I think, applied it to conservation because he thought about what the effects would be in natural populations. So thinking about deer, these fragmented parks in England, worried about the, the problem of inbreeding, went out and talked to people, the, the actual managers, and found out that they were aware of this problem and they moved animals around. And today, this is what we would call genetic rescue. So even back in the 1800s in England, they were, they were using genetic rescue to deal with problems of injury. And this is, uh, today we still talk about problems with, with, genetic, with genetic rescue. And with grizzly bears, part of the problem is moving grizzly bears around is expensive and dangerous. And so this is attempts to try to come up with uh, just moving around sperm. 
So as I said, the field of conservation biology really began in 1980, and this was really the first, Sir Otto Frankel was an Australian geneticist who was, I think, the first geneticist who really wrote about trying to apply genetics to problems in conservation. So this is a paper he presented at the International Congress of Genetics, where he talked about from trying to apply principles of evolution to problems in conservation. And what I like about this is a little table we had there on the time scale of concern. And I really like this. So this is so this is talking about plants. And he's prim he primarily worked with plants, but he also talked here about animals or wildlife. And so the, the time frame that we're interested in for the genetical conservationist is uh, the objective. Our objective is dynamic wildlife conservation. And the time frame that we're interested in is something in the order of 10,000 years. Where he contrasts that with a politician whose objective is current public interest and whose time frame is the next election. <laughs> And I think this is still a lot of the problems in trying to deal with conservation from the society, the perspective of, of society. When you have a large number of politicians who don't even accept evolution, you can see where we're really behind the eight ball in terms of trying to apply science to, to these kinds of issues from a, from a political or societal perspective. So what I'd like to talk about today, like Gordon said, is people going out and harvesting, I'm just going to be talking about animals, so going out and harvesting animals and what genetic effects that can have on populations. And so humans have been going out and harvesting, I thought there's nothing to come up here, obviously it's not. People have gone out and harvested animals ever since humans have, have been on the planet. And the genetic problem is that when we hunt and fish, what we tend to do is remove those animals which are most phenotypically desirable and harvest them. And so we can re that can impose selection that can reduce the frequency of those desirable phenotypes. And this is the complete opposite of what we do in agriculture and aquaculture, where we try to breed for those individuals who have those desirable phenotypes. So in harvesting wild populations, we do the opposite. So we're, we're allowing those individuals to breed which are least desirable. And so one example of this is the silver fox. And this was, uh, again, in eastern Canada. So there was a long-term data set where they went out and collected, the, looked at the pelts by hunters and by trappers both. And they looked at the frequency, so in the, in the fox there were three different phenotypes. There's the red fox up top, the silver fox down here, and there's the heterozygote, which is called a cross, which had a slightly, apparently there's a phenotype they could tell that was intermediate between those two. And the silver, this phenotype is, is caused by a single allele, which is recessive, so <coughs> only the R, little r, little r, r silver. And the R, the large R, the red, is dominant. And so the silver pelts were more valuable. So when hunters went out, probably not only more valuable, probably they're all perhaps more visible as well. And so Charles Elton, one of the first founders of ecology, collected this long-term data set. And J.B.S. Haldane, who was one of the first population geneticists, and J.B.S. Haldane, Develop most, well, he developed a lot of models trying to predict the effects of selection on allele frequencies. So when Elton showed these data to Haldane, Haldane tried to build a model that would explain these data. And so the dots are the actual data points, and the lines are what you would expect given a single locus in which the silver morph has a 3% reduction in fitness because of, of selective hunting. So you can see it, it follows it fairly well over that 100 year period. And I think what's most interesting here, it's not the silver and the red because that's what you would expect to happen. The interesting thing is even though this was dominant and the crosses look more like the red, they also decreased in frequency because of the fact that they contained the, the small R allele 
And so even though their phenotype was favorable, because of the strong selection against the little r, they actually decreased in frequency. So when people thought about how this applies to lots of other animals because of hunting and fishing, so one of the most dramatic examples is elephants, which are uh, hunted for their ivory. And so there's a number of cases where they've gone out and looked at the frequency of both having tusks or not having tusks because there, there is a genetic difference. And so the frequency of tusklessness, and for example, some of the data from Zambia, the frequency of tusklessness, <coughs> tusklessness increased from 10 to 38 percent in 20 years from 1969 to 1989. And that co coincided with the legal selective ivory hunting. And this is another example. This is size in Western Australia, Western rock lobster. So these are harvested. And this is year. This is their carapace length. And there's a minimum size. So the lobsters have to be over this size or they can't be harvested, so they have to be thrown back. And so the manager of, the, of these uh, lobsters looked at these data and over time and he speculated that the reason that the size declined so dramatically from 1970 to 2005 is probably partially the fact that the larger, the, the smaller individuals are being thrown back and the larger individuals are being harvested. And this shows one of the problems in trying to sort out so we can see these phenotypic changes. So it's clear that the phenotype is getting smaller but the question is, is that a genetic response? And it could just be a density response. So it, it could be a, a effect. in this case, it also could be the effect of, of change in temperature. So the ocean temperature has blown up you know, over that same 30 year period. And the predictions are you would also expect there to be a smaller size of maturity because of warming. So often it's hard to pull out this phenotyp seeing a phenotypic effect, trying to determine whether or not it has a genetic basis can be difficult. So Darwin developed our, our ideas of, of selection. And Darwin came up, he said there's three different types of selection. Natural selection, artificial selection, which is what goes on in agriculture. And third, he said, was sexual selection, where individuals are selected on the basis not of whether they survive or not, but how successful they are in achieving mates. And Darwin was aware of the fact that hunting could have an effect on populations. It's actually surprising to me that he <coughs> didn't develop this idea further, but this is in one of his books. He talks about the fact that the Incas of South America follow the reverse of the Scottish sportsmen. Or the, the Scottish sportmen, sportsmen are steadily killed to find the stags, thus causing the race to degenerate. So Darwin was aware that this selective removal could cause this genetic change in the population, but he didn't really, other, other than this, I really can't find any references where Darwin talked about this. So what I'd like to talk about today is looking at the effects of fishing hunting. And I won't talk about specimen collectors, but talking about fishing and hunting, talk a little bit about sexual selection, and then talk about how we can apply this understanding to try to harvest population sustainably. And what do we do if a population has already been, been harmed by unnatural selection? Is there anything we can do about trying to recover those populations? So and this is really, when it, when it comes to fishing, this is really an important problem because wild marine fisheries comprise such a major part of the human diet. So it was estimated just a couple of few years ago that about 15% of all the animal protein in the human diet comes from commercially important marine, wild marine fisheries. So this is not a, a trivial problem. So just trying to think about what can be the effects of, of human harvest. So what I presented so far is if we, we are changing the phenotypic frequency, 
So if we are taking the largest fish, or we are taking the largest stags, we are changing those phenotypic frequencies. And as long as those phenotypic frequencies, as long as those phenotypes have a genetic basis, then we would expect there to be some kind of response, either through modified natural selection or modified sexual selection. And I asked Gordon that apparently you, you read this weekend a little bit about heritability, or just uh, to make it uh, easier, simpler. So what we mean by heritability is whether or not a trait has the individuals in a population which are phenotypically different, is there some genotypes associated, associated with those differences? Now, the way we measure that is by the concept of, of heritability. In this case, it's a narrow sense, which tells us about the response to selection. So that heritability in the narrow sense is the response that we see in a population over the selective differential. And stop me if there's anything that's unclear if you have any questions. So what this means is that, so here we have some distribution of some continuous trait. Here we have the mean of the population in the parental generation. And then either through artificial or natural or unnatural selection, here is the mean of the, the parents. And then we allow those parents to reproduce and then these are three possible means of their progeny. So the, the two extremes are, there's no genetic basis to this trait. If that's the case, then the progeny will look just like the parents were the generation before, because there won't be any genetic response. The other extreme is that all the phenotypic variability has a genetic basis. In the case that heritability is one, in that case, the progeny will have the same mean as, as the selective parents. But almost always, the, parent, the progeny are going to be somewhere between the original <coughs> mean of the population and the original mean of, of the parents. And wherever we fall on, the, on this line is what we mean by heritability. So in this case, the heritability is a quarter meaning that the progeny are a quarter of the way between this point and this point. And virtually every trait you can think of, heritability is, is, some, is going to be somewhere between, between these two extremes. So any, any questions on, on heritability? So here is an example of a, a decrease in body size that is thought to be resulting from selective harvest. So these are pink salmon on uh, off the coast of British Columbia and Ed Ricker collected these data, worked for the Canadian government for years and years. And so after World War II there was a change in the gillnet mesh size so that because of the fact that larger fish, so pink salmon become sexually mature at two years of age. So they spawn in fresh water or brackish water. They go out to the ocean, they grow up, and they get to be about this big. And then at two years of age, they all come back. So unlike other salmon or trout that sex become sexually mature at different ages, pink salmon, it's always two years of age. So we don't have the problem with trying to deal with the fact that size is often compounded with, with age, because all these fish are the, the same age. And this is looking from 1951 to 1974. <coughs> this is the mean weight of capture in two different areas, two different coastal fisheries off the British Columbia coast. And the reason there are two different lines for each of these is that because all the fish come back at two years of age, the odd and even year fish never exchange genes. So it's like there's almost two different species, although they're the same species, in, in one stream because everybody comes back everybody comes back at two years of age. So if you were born in an even year, you come back in an, two years later, your project come back two years later and so on. Or if you're born in born in an odd year, you come back in an odd year. So for each one of these two areas, 
there's these two temporal populations and both of them, so all four populations show the, the, same, the same trend that seems to be in response. And again, if there is selective harvest, which Ricker showed that there was, and there is a genetic basis, then we would expect to see this. And so a few years ago, we did some work in Alaska looking at uh, heritability in pink salmon, and we measured a number of different traits. So what we did, we went out to this, this wild this stream in the Resurrection Bay by Seward. We went out and collected tissues and collected fish, or the tissues so that we do the genetic analysis. And then, so here are the uh, fish that were sexually mature. We took sperm and eggs. We mixed them together so we had one male with one female. We took uh, genetic samples of, of the adults. And then we raised the eggs in a hatchery. And then pink salmon spend virtually no time in, in fresh water. They go right out to the ocean. So we kept them in a hatchery until they hatched. We kept them a short time in the hatchery, and then they were released into Resurrection Bay, and, and they came back two years later. So we did, the, the crossing was artificial, but these fish grew up out in wild conditions. And then what we did was we looked at the average size of the parents and looked at the average size of the offspring. As well as size, we looked at other things as well, but for this, I'm, I'm just going to talk about size. So this is... So males and females are different. There's many ways. But in pink salmon, males and females have a different distribution of length. So we did males and females separately. So the top graph shows, so this is mid-parent. So we measured the length of the mother and the length of the father. And the mean of that is the mid-parent. And then we looked at the mean length of <laughs> Not again. This guy timed out. Just turn it back on. Okay. <laughs> We've had more trouble with projectors, and but we haven't had this trouble just, before. It it went off, so just turn it back. I wait till the bulb cools for about a minute. Then it's hit the projector on. <laughs> Any questions thus far? <laughs> did it Did it give you a heat error message? No, if I don't, not, I would just no, try it. Turn it back on. But projector <laughs> off button is flashing. Just that's because the projector's off. Turn it. <laughs> <laughs> press power on it up here. You can't do anything till the bolt cools. It takes a minute or two. Well, that's if the error was the heat. I'm not sure. It's the larger oh. one. No. Yep. It shouldn't let us turn it on until the bulb cools. Yeah. Oh, there it goes. I got it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. First day I came in and my laptop, which is new, worked. I said, uh, and I sat there a half an hour waiting for class to start, and then all of a sudden, the computer went to sleep, and then when I turned it back on, it goes to bed. Haven't got it fixed since. <laughs> and Max works. Max has to work, but no one's PC that has to work. I have a question, maybe to just take some time. Oh, never mind. Right, yeah. what's the question? Well, I'm just curious, how did you, if, if you release them when they were fingerlings, how did you mark they them to know when they came back? Well, we didn't mark them. How do you think we marked them? With ear. Did you do ear? The ear? Or whatever. Ear but we're geneticists. Um, <laughs> just them. Got you. Hmm? you just genotyped them? Yeah, that's what yeah, I, I left that a little bit. I remember I said we took the, the genetic samples of the parents, mm -hmm. and then when the fish came back, we took their genotypes, and having the genotypes of their parents, we were able to put them into full, uh, identify who their parents were. It, so was this the whole release from that year of the hatchery was all of this system, or was it yeah, This was subset? an experimental hatchery, yes. Oh, okay, I got you. I understand. There, there's more to it than that. So this was, well, so the, the side story is this was part of the Exxon Valdez oil spill. We got money from the Exxon Valdez oil spill trustee council, and they built a nice big hatchery. They gave us a whole lot of money to do this experiment, and then they decided they didn't have enough money for a ladder at the hatchery. 
So the fish came back, you know, Simon returned or they were releasing from, so the fish came back, but they had no way to get up into the hatchery. So we had to go out and angle them or hook or uh, <laughs> we call that when you have a hook in the uh, snagging. Snagging, thank you. Way to snag you. So we didn't get as many fish back as we wanted to, because but, but these are the data. So this is mid-parent length, and these are the length of daughters. So as you can see, those parents that were small, their progeny tended to be small, and those parents that were large, their progeny tended to be large. So the heritability, so the, another way to measure narrow sense of heritability is the, the slope of this line. And so this, the heritability of the female length at sexual maturity was 0.34 and males was 0.45. So that means that about 40% of the variability in length at sexual maturity in pink salmon, at least pink salmon that we worked with, was due to genetic differences between individuals. So if there was a selective differential, we would expect to see the kind of response that, that we saw. And this has become known as fishing-induced evolution, or FIE. There's a really nice review, I think, just in the last year of annual review of ecology and systematics looking at fishery-induced evolution. And so salmon have been extensively harvested along the west coast of North America for over 100 years. And as we'll see, the potential fishery-induced evolution was first recognized over 100 years ago and in some cases, the harvest rates are really high. So this is a slide from Jeff Hard, who was the co-author of the paper that I started, that this is based on. Jeff works for the National Marine Fishery Service. And that there's a bunch of different types of gear that are used. So here we can see the, the, the simple-minded view. So we have the gill nut here, we have large fish, and the larger fish have more difficulty going through the gill net. So there's this selective sieve and the smaller fish going through the gill net. And so the idea that this goes back a long time ago, so this is a paper published in 1902 where the naturalist for the United States Fish Commission pointed out that, as the point I made in the very beginning, in agriculture you never think of selling your finest cattle and keeping all the ones to breed. And the salmon would certainly deteriorate in size if only the smaller were allowed to breed. So the idea that this is potentially important has been around for a long time. So Darwin pointed it out in hunting in the 1800s. In 1902, people were already aware of the possibility of salmon. So this is a nice picture of what Chinook salmon used to look like when they were captured in gill nets in the Columbia River. And there, that's what I just mentioned. So here are some data. So this is looking at, so you can do some nice um, experiments in, with, with salmon. So this is looking at a Lake Bristol Bay in Alaska, which is the biggest sockeye fishery. So what, they, what was done here is, again, looking at females and males separately excuse me, females and males separately, because in, in sockeye salmon, it's not only a different size, but also different ages. So sockeye salmon can be, become sexually mature at age two, three, or four, or even sometimes more than that, but usually two, three, and four. So when the fish are coming back, they're not only different sizes, but they're also different ages. And so this shows, if we just look here, so this shows the distribution of solid line it's the distribution before the fishery. So look, capturing the fish before they're actually going through the fishery, going back to this lake. And this is capturing the fish going to that lake after the fishery. And you can see that there is two things going on. <coughs> First is there's the most dramatic is the change in age. Age three fish are much larger. So they're much more vulnerable to the, the fishery. And so the initially, the fish that were age two were less than 1%. Up here, they're 4%. And so here, there we have the before and then the after. 
for the fish that escape to go on fishery tend to be younger and, and smaller. So again, if there's a genetic basis either to, and as we'll see, we can get selection for early sexual maturity. And so one, one of the things, issues about conservation genetics is the use of uh, model organisms as well as, as real organisms. So we can't always do experiments with sockeye salmon or <coughs> Atlantic cod, but we can do experiments with guppies. So this is some work that Dave Resnick and Cameron Gallimbor, and Cameron Gallimbor was a grad student here a long time ago. He's now at Colorado State University. So what they did was they went out and collected guppies from two wild populations. So one was a wild population where there was low predation in terms of uh, what, what fish predators were available, and the other was a high predation source. And so what they found is that, and if you think about it, if, if there's high predation, you're less likely to live very long. So greater predation results and greater selection for early se earlier sexual maturity, because if you wait too long, you never you never get to reproduce. So, as you would predict in the wild population, that population with a high predation. So this is female age at first first reproduction was 82 days, and the population with lower predation was almost about 88 days. And more interestingly. When they selected, so they put them in the, in the lab, and then exposed them to high predation or low predation, and then they looked at female age at, after several generations. They found that putting them into high predation in, in a laboratory experiment selected for earlier sexual maturity in both of these populations. So what's going on here is that those guppies that become sexually mature are less likely to live long enough. So early, greater predation, even if it's random, is selecting for early, earlier maturing fish. So the, the best example of this is Atlantic cod, both on the east and west coast of, of the Atlantic Ocean. So the, these are some data from Nova Scotia that Terry Beecham published. So looking at median age at first sexual maturity, so in 1959, it was six years of age. And by 1979, it was down somewhere about three years of age. So a dramatic change in just 20 years. And 20 years, geneticists measured time by generations. So anybody know how you estimate generation interval? Uh, what is the generation interval? So, you know, so when we talk, how many, let me ask that question the other way. So how many generations do you think 20 years is? And perhaps more importantly, what would you need, what would you want to know to figure out how many generations that is? How old they are when they reproduce? How old they are when they reproduce. And they, they can be anywhere between Six and, well, you can see the age that they first reproduce is there. So how many generations is 20 years? Hmm? Well, let's say it's four, okay? Let's say over the time interval it's four. How many generations is that? You know, it must be a Five. trick question because I know you can divide Five. 20 by 4. <laughs> So it's not five, it's probably much larger than five because it's the, it's the average age of, of reproduction, not, not the early stage of reproduction. And since they can reproduce, well, historically, they probably went up to 15 or 20 years, the generation interval of any species, species is the average age of parents. Yeah, that's probably a good guess. <laughs> You, you don't have enough information here, but it's it's more than it's more than seven, because the females, anyhow, larger females have more eggs. So if you if you reproduce at age seven or age eight, you may produce twice as many eggs at, at age eight. 
So even if half the fish are maturing at age seven, half are maturing at age eight, the average age of parents is much is about 7.7 .7 because those eight-year-old fish are producing twice as many eggs. So it's sort of the, the weighted age of average reproduction. But anyhow, the, the point is that when you're when you're thinking of genetic genetically trying to understand populations, it's not numbers of years, which is really important, it's a generation interval. And generation interval can go from annual plants one year to you know, mice or drosophila, sometimes months, or you can have species, really slow growing reptiles, the generation interval may be 50 years. But anyhow, going back to here, so this is a, a very hard, it's not only that the fish are getting smaller, but the younger females produce fewer eggs and they're also much lower quality eggs. So also the, uh, the survival ship, survivorship from egg to first year decreased dramatically during this, same, this time frame. And, and so this is, and the, so these data are from Nova Scotia. I'll be talking later, I'll show you similar data from Iceland, similar data from Norway, anywhere in the Atlantic Ocean you see the same pattern. And over the last 150 years, the Atlantic cod have been harvested, the average age of reproduction has gone down dramatically. But again, it, it's hard to know whether it's genetic or not, because, so if you have a bunch of fish swimming around the ocean, and you, and you remove half of them, there's more food available, so there's more to eat. So just by harvesting, even if there's no genetic effect, we would expect there to be a faster growth rate, and in fish, which can become sexually mature at different ages, faster fish that grow faster usually become sexually, or sexually mature at an earlier age. So we can't, just by looking at the, these, this phenotypic change, we can't tell whether it's genetic or not. It could, or maybe it is, maybe it isn't. <coughs> so we can look at the effects of hunting as well as fishing. And hunting, this is the best example of the effects of hunting. So this was, um, obviously, this is published now God, 13 years ago. It was published on the, the cover of Nature, just because people were cheap or so exciting to people. And so here, things become a little bit more complicated because I mentioned sexual selection. So what's going on? Many of the characteristics that, that hunters find desirable are associated with, with sexual selection. So large body size, large antler size, large horn size are all things that, that fit into to sexual selection. So both in fish and in a lot of mammals that are hunted, there's this tension going on between artificial selection or unnatural selection and, and sexual selection. So the reason there has been, as Gordon and people he's worked with have shown larger rams with larger horns or have an advantage in terms of sexual selection in terms of mating. But hunters like to hunt those individuals. And so it's really big money. People pay thousands of dollars to be able to go out and shoot a, a record big horn sheep. So trophy hunting is, is a big deal. And so this was work done by Dave Coltman in, uh, Edmund, in Edmonton. So, with this, so where, where this was done at Sheep Mountain, Gordon? Ram Mountain. Ram Mountain, which is where? North of Calgary, 100 miles in the east. So is that the place that you first went to when you came out here in 19... What, three or whatever it was? <laughs> yeah, the first place I went to do field work in grad school. Now, I actually found a letter that you wrote to me back then before you came back to Missoula from up there. When I was going through my files the other day. So again, to predict how whether or not we expect there to be a phenotypic response, we have to know the heritability. So Coltman did something similar to what we did, only not as controlled with our work with Pink Salmon. So he, by looking at genotypes in the population, he could tell who were the parents and who were the offspring. 
and you just use, you use those to estimate the narrow sense heritability, and you look at two characteristics, horn length and weight, and then breeding value is a measure, it's a, it's a uh, modified phenotypic value. So individuals with larger breeding value have larger horn length. And so he looked at those rams that were trophy harvested over here in horn length and looked at the ones that were unharvested. So there was a tendency for rams with larger horns to be harvested. And, and also males, rams that had larger size also. So it's clear that larger males are preferred by trophy hunters. And then looking over time, very similar graph to what we saw with pink salmon, that there has been this decline in mean weight, mean weight up above as well as mean horn weight. And so it looks like the, the selective harvest of, of this population has resulted in smaller body size and, and smaller horns. And, the, and the, the horn length is corrected for body size, so it's not just a factor of body size that we're looking at here. So sexual selection, as I said, that often op operates in the, in the other direction from harvester and natural selection. <laughs> and so this is a, uh, Roger Hanwin is at Woods Hole working with squids. And he, uh, 18 years ago now, came up, not came up with other people's views, it talked about unnatural sexual selection that could affect recruitment in squids. And as I said, a lot of the things that hunters or fishers are looking for, like antlers, horns, kites, which is the jaw on, on fish, which is sexual selection, body size, or deep bodies, are associated both with selective harvest and with sexual selection. And so the absence of mate choice and sexual selection in hatcheries could reduce the, the fitness of, of hatchery fish. And so th this idea, so when fish are out in, in the wild, sexual selection is going on, so those fish which have certain characteristics are more successful, greater, greater body size, where if in hatcheries where males and females are taken not at random but by human characteristics rather than by sexual selected characteristics, there could be an effect. And there were some nice experiments done looking at the progeny where they allowed the, the males and females to choose their own mates versus when they, they chose the mates in the hatchery. And they found out that by eliminating sexual selection in the hatchery, the, the progeny where they had eliminated sexual selection had dramatically reduced lifetime survivorship. So there, there is evidence of the importance of allowing sexual selection in wild populations. And sexual selection is really interesting for lots of different reasons. So Chris Foote, who wrote the guest box, I think it's chapter two in the book if you've read that, so Chris works on sexual selection in sockeye salmon. And one of the interesting things was when Chris was working, he was trying to come up with a, a model of a female so that he could look at the males interact with one another without having a real female there. And so he tried, all, he tried different body shapes and other things. And one day he threw in something that was red into the water and the males went crazy. <laughs> so it turned out it didn't even have to look like a female. As long as it was red, the females got, it, got excited about it. And then there's something about the color red, because this is true basically in all vertebrates, other fish, and humans as well. Red really does have a, a sexual, seems to have a sexual effect. So Jeff Hutchins has done a lot of work looking at this interaction between selection, sexual selection and body size and trying to understand under what conditions. So if we're trying to minimize selective effects, if we can allow sexual selection to take place, sexual selection may act in the opposite direction. And this is, if you go back and look at that paper, this is trying to look at that balance in sockeye salmon and I never understand these kinds of graphs, so I'm not going to try to explain them. But looking at 
the uh, effects of the relative fitness, where we have some kind of stand, standard deviation from the mean, both looking at natural and, and sexual selection, and trying to understand <coughs> what is going to be the optimum under fishing pressure versus under natural selection. So what are, what are the implications of this? And I want to talk about two different things. One is uh, sustainable harvest. So how can we harvest animals so that we're not going to bring about this harmful effect? And the second is, well, if we do screw up, can we go back and fix it? And again, this is Atlantic cod, or this case called uh, yeah, Atlantic cod. This is off the coast of Norway. So in this particular population, there are two different areas that the, the cod usually are found in. So in the northern areas where they're feeding, but when they spawn, they move down here further south. And so when we harvest the fish, we can either harvest them where they're feeding or we can harvest them where they're spawning. So you could ask, well, let, well, let me ask. So if you were a fish manager, do you think it would be better to harvest the fish where they're spawning or where they're feeding? Mm -hmm. And why? Because if they're feeding, then like um, there's a random chance of getting uh, good and bad. Um, but if you're going to spawning, you might take out all the good and just put back all that. Yeah, and that, that makes sense. It's not the right answer given this situation. And that's because if we harvest here, if, if we harvest where they're spawning, at least we're giving the big fish a chance to get down here and spawn. Uh, okay. So, I, I mean, and you're, it's not that what you said is wrong because it depends upon how we're harvesting down here. But if we harvest here, then those large fish never even get to go spawn. But if we harvest them here and we allow some of them to spawn, then it's reduced selection. And so the, the, the models, then you have to have a lot more information than I've given you to answer this question. So if we harvest spawner fishery versus the, the feeder fishery. So again, we expect there, so historically, they harvested when they were spawning, and then they switched and started harvesting when they were feeding, and there was a, a more dramatic effect on the population when, when, they, when they went to a feeder fishery. So the specific example isn't so important. What is important, if we are trying to manage populations, trying to think about, okay, how can I harvest the, the fish or whatever it is we're harvesting in a way that we would expect to minimize these these harmful selective changes. So the historical fishery select for late maturing fish. Fish got to go to spawn. Those that were larger, older, had more eggs. So there, you could even imagine there was selection for late maturing fish. We're in the current fishery where you select for early maturing fish because you, the slow growing fish never even really get to recruit. So again, the specific case isn't as important as just trying to think about ways that we could minimize these expected effects. So how about recovery? And so historically, people have said, well, marine fish are so fertile, they're so fecund, they produce so many eggs that if a fish population is over-harvested, all we have to do is stop harvesting, and they'll be highly resilient, and they'll, they'll recover. However, this is again a paper by Jeff Hutchings, who's done a lot of nice work in this area. He looked at population recovery. What we've got here is a different species in which there was, there was evidence for over, over harvest. And this is looking at population recovery. So one means that population did recover after five years. So a few points, there was evidence for recovery, but most of the points are below the line, and you can see that those populations 
which had the greatest decline over this over a 15-year period. So there was the greatest depletion are the ones who are least likely to recover. So the empirical evidence that fish populations don't recover the way that we would like them to. And so we can think about that in this case we looked at before. So could we re could this effect in Arctic cod be reversed? So what happens if we stop selecting, well, let's say we stop the fishery altogether. Would we expect this effect to be, re to, to be reversed? And what do you think? Just, just thinking about from first principles. Yeah, it'd probably be slow at first and maybe be able to recover, but, um, but we probably selected, we probably removed like uh, whatever beneficial alleles the older generation have, and so it could never really go back to the things they were, yeah. unless um, unless there was ex like extreme pressure and new alleles formed. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that you said. So, what are if, if Gordon were asked going to ask you this question in an exam? What? are the two critical things you, you would want to talk about in terms of whether you could reverse that effect? Selection. Could you have sexual selection? Be like if they, if, the, if they want to mate with the larger fish, if they do better, then they can go back, because they do they Yeah, but you know, you can, so. yeah. But let, let, let's, you're right, but let's forget sexual selection. Let's make it simple, let's put that on top. It's so. A the diversity frequency. within it, so the ability for that phenotype to come back. Okay, so the genetic basis of the phenotype. Yeah. So where are there genetic changes from here to here? Mm -hmm. And what's the second thing? Allelic, like allelic frequency and then selection? Or what do you mean by then selection? What about selection? Right, so it, if you have less... Uh, less frequency of alleles that cause this later reproductive age and then that's already reduced there and then there's no high selection for that reproductive maturity to shoot back up, why would they increase in frequency at that point? I'm trying, oh, yes, I mean I agree, but I'm trying to make it simpler. So yes, there's, the number? Is, is there a genetic basis? So we, we need to know the genetic basis. What else do we need to know to predict? How, many? Yeah. How many? Just the effect of population size? Well, basically, if the, natural, if the population size is large enough that natural selection can overcome drift. It is. But there's something really crucial that you're missing, which is really obvious. I think it's obvious. Is there differential survival or reproduction? Yeah. Is there, how strong is the selection? So the two things we need to predict the effects of selection is what's the genetic basis for the trait and how strongly are we selecting. So as I said, you know, some of the salmon populations, we remove 90% of the fish from them, so there's really strong selection. So to know whether this is going to recover or not, you have to think about, okay, there probably has been some genetic change, and as I don't know the, the fellow in the back pointed out, we, we would need to know what those changes are to predict. But the other thing we need to know is how strong is the selection going to be for later, later sexual maturity. And, I, and my guess and probably your guess is that it's probably going to be fairly weak compared to the selection that we imposed. Mm -hmm. So probably recovery is going to be pretty slow. I, I think just thinking about the problem, you could come up with that. And so again, well, I should have changed this. Sometimes heritability, I did this on purpose, not really. Sometimes it's called little h squared, and that's all the same as cap, capital H, and that's a narrow sense heritability. So as I said way back when, the heritability is the response over the selection, and so we can turn that equation around and say the response is just the selective differential multiplied by the heritability. So what we need to know is both the heritability, the genetic basis for the trait, and also how strongly we're selected. What is R standing for there? Response. Response, thank you. 
remember back at the beginning I said these are the parents, these are the progeny. The difference between the parents and the progeny is a response. So how much is the population responding to the selection? And S is selective differential. So a, uh, a paper in 2005 came up with the term Darwinian debt that just making the point that it takes longer to fix something than it does to screw it up. So it's one of the difficult things is trying to know what is the heritability of age and sexual maturity in, in Atlantic cod? Is it, is it genetic? So it's really hard to do selective selection experiments in a species like Atlantic cod, which lives eight years and lives out in the ocean. So one way we hope that we can get around these problems is by using some of the new techniques we have now, the genomics, where we, we can potentially get at some of these questions that we couldn't get at historically. So this was a paper that Gordon and I and Paul Hohenlohe from the University of Idaho wrote a few years ago where we talked about population trying to apply genetics to problems in, in conservation. So these blue boxes are issues that we could deal with before when we using microsatellite OSI, mitochondrial DNA, so we could look at, we could estimate population size, we could look at population structure, we could detect hybrids, we could detect inbreeding, but we really could get at some of these more interesting questions like what is the genetic basis of inbreeding depression? Are there genotype by environment interactions? Can we look at the genes associated for local adaptation? Can we look at genes associated for outbreeding depression? Can we look at loss of adaptive variation? We couldn't do that historically, but the potential is there we can do that now. So in this case, we're thinking about the, at the uh, Atlanta Cod, you can think historically, these fish were locally adapted, late sexual maturity. How do we know whether or not that change we saw had a genetic basis? So this was a paper, this is done, same species, Atlanta Cod, but this is in Iceland, not in Norway, or, <coughs> West Coast or East Coast of Canada. So this is spawning stock biomass in thousands of tons. And so that this that's the, the gray area. So the spawning mass, the spawning biomass is going way down over a 50-year period. And the fishing mortality has, has gone up. So the, the proportion of fish which survive is much lower than it was historically. So there's been strong selection over this 50 year period. And just like in the coast of Canada, here's the, I believe these are the average age of sexual maturity. So it was 10 years of age in 1948. And now, well, in 2005, it was about six years of age. So there was this decline just like we saw in, in Canadian cod. So there's now, there's been selection for earlier sexual maturity. Fish become sexually mature at an earlier age, they're smaller, they produce fewer eggs, and they produce eggs which are of lower quality. There was, there's this locus in, uh, in cod which was found to be associated with age of, of sexual maturity. So when you go out, so what they did was age the fish in the fishery and then look at this single locus and there were two, well, there, there are two, two, well, two alleles, I'll call them alleles, but they're actually very, there's more than, well, let's just call, think of them as two alleles, A and B, and the older fish have a really high frequency of the B allele and we never see the B allele in the smaller fish. So if we begin to selectively harvest the population so that the older fish are not alike and never reproduce, we are going to be selectively removing the B allele 
So what we would expect to see, if this is, if this is our understanding is correct, we would expect to see the B allele to decrease in frequency over time. And then lo and behold, it's a selective harvest in a fish population, bringing about a, a genetic change in, in a population. And you can see, let, let's say, well, we don't, to, to, to know the response, we would have to know whether the, yeah, whether the heterozygote is intermediate or whether it's recessive. But regardless, you can see selection might, is, is, the response of selection is going to be fairly slow because the B allele ought to become same there. Of course, things are never as simple as we would like them to be. So it turns out, so this is pretty dramatic that we had this one, one gene which brought about such a, a dramatic change in age of sexual maturity, where it turns out that that's not one gene, it's a great big chunk of chromosomes. chromosomes. So there's a big genome, genomic region where not only is that pan gene found, but lots of other genes are found as well. So how many genes are in 20 centimorgans? Anyone? Anyone? What is a centimorgan? 100 morgans. <laughs> no, it's 100th of a morgan. A morgan so divided, divided by, by 10,000. Divided by 100. <laughs> so what, but what does it mean? If I, if I tell you that, what's centimorgans, what's that, what is that a unit of? Space no, no. Is it distance for ten genes. Yeah. yeah. What, and how do we measure distance? Linkage. And how do we measure linkage? Well, Think back to genetics 101. Right. When, the number of basters. You guys are too genomic. Think Morgan. Just measuring. Think it. Mendel. Measuring a chromosome? Stains like this a chromosome? <laughs> How do we measure the length of chromosomes if you're a geneticist? Uh, hmm? pairs? No. More, Mendel didn't know about base pairs. More, Thomas Hunt Morgan didn't know what a base pair was. Well, he didn't even know about DNA. So if you met Morgan is named for Thomas Hunt Morgan, who was a Drosophila geneticist in Columbia 100 years ago. So how did Thomas Hunt Morgan measure? Is it the start, the, the, stop hmm? the start and the stop codon? The start and the stop codon? He didn't know there were codons. So I thought he just looked at the karyotype, just looked at the stain nope. of the... Nope. I heard the word in the back here. Recombination? Recombination. Thanks, Gordon. <laughs> yes. So centimorgan is a measure of the amount of recombination. So genes that are closer together in general have less recombination Genes further apart are more likely to recombine. So it's how often the genes appear together versus... Yeah, from the parental form. Yeah. So what now, so a centimorgan is a measure of recombination. So even if, so what, what do you think a centimorgan might mean? So... Oh. Isn't it like... How much recombination is a centimorgan? How much recombination? Like the percentage of it crossing over? How much recombination? Like 1%. One 1%? Percent. One percent. Yeah. yeah. So it's simple. Genetics, genetics is really simple. So a centimorgan means 1% recombination. So, we, so Morgan and geneticists until a few years ago didn't know anything about DNA, didn't know anything about base pairs. But they couldn't measure how often genes recombine. So 20 centimorgans means that the, this is a chunk of chromosome where it's 20, 20 map, you 20 map, 20, the recombination rate in that length is 20%. So it's a big chunk of chromosome. Well, how big of a chunk is it? How many, how big is the human genome? How many centimorgans 
I'm not sure. <laughs> so, well, just, you know, so if, if a chromosome, how many Sam Morgans in a chromosome? Roughly, the average chromosome. I don't know either, but 100, would you accept 100, Gordon? Yeah. Maybe 200. So 20 centimorgans is a big chunk of a chromosome. So now, how many genes do you think are in 20 centimorgans? Lots. Thousands? Yeah, probably thousands. Yeah, thousands. So this is a, a huge chunk of chromosome, and so it's not this one gene, but it's everything else which is in that 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 twenty percent that's called here a genomic island. So, mm. Cinnamorgan on humans is one million base pairs. So I you know, I made the the argument at the beginning that these effects could really be important because we get humans get so much of their food protein source in the ocean. And this was a, in uh, 2013, Penske and Blumby looked at a meta-analysis where they went out and they looked at fish populations that were either classified as over-harvested or not over-harvested in the same species. And then they looked at allelic diversity and what they found was that those populations which were classified as over-harvested, looking at microsatellites, had an average, on an average 12% less allelic diversity than the populations that were not over-harvested. So we, we can see genetic effects on, not selective effects so much, but we can see that apparently harvesting has reduced the effective population size so it has brought about a, a loss of, of a little diversity. Isn't that, um, I guess when you're talking about the percentage of loss of genetic diversity, because they're just comparing harvested versus over-harvested, isn't that kind of an underestimate because you're still comparing two harvested yeah, species? Yeah, or populations. Not or po populations. Yeah, they're comparing within a species. That's yeah. what I meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm not a, a big fan of meta-analysis, but I think when other people do it, it can be useful, especially if you like the results. <laughs> so there's a lot of problems with meta-analysis, but you know, and I, I think they did a nice job. And so it, it, there is, you can see an effect of, 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 har of over-harvesting. So conclusions, little attention has really been paid to the effects of human harvest especially when you consider that Darwin talked mm -hmm. about it, Salmon Weil just talked about it 120 years ago, but managers have really been reluctant and so managers have really been reluctant and I think there's a couple of different reasons. I think one is managing fish populations is complicated, especially I mean, managing fish populations is complicated enough. And then when you tell people they have to put genetics on top of it, I think there's a real reluctance of managers because you know, genetics sort of scares people. And so it just makes your life more complicated. I think that's one reason. I think the other thing is people, so when Kaltman published his paper in Nature looking at the effect of trophy harvesting, the hunting, I don't know if lobby is the right word, but people in sport of hunting are very very angry about it, wrote a number of really scathing critiques of the Colton paper, criticizing it because they didn't, I think basically they, did, they didn't want it to be true. And I mean, some of the things they said were like they, pub they published in a really bad journal, they published in Nature. <laughs> okay, harvest will, sexual selection. So your, your question about sexual selection is important but it's even, it's even more complicated. And we don't really ne necessarily know how we're going to interact. But I think the, the exciting thing is I think there, is, there are a lot of opportunities out there for nice research, especially now using genomic techniques 
and when we can go back and look at historical samples where we can look at fish scales or other things, I think there's real opportunity to do studies like the COD study where they look at changes over time. So I think this really is a, an exciting area to integrate population genetics, conservation biology. So, you know, just some simple-minded platitudes, really. So if we really want sustainable harvest, so we should promote harvest that maintains breeding populations that are large and diverse enough to pull up. So we want to maintain the genetic variation present, reducing even though non-selective effects can still cause changes, the more selective we harvest the population, the greater the selective intensity, so the greater the response is going to be. And so recovery might take longer. So recovery is going to take long if there's a genetic effect than if the recovery is just ecological. And, re and regardless, I, I think uh, this, I think, is the most important thing, that if we are going to ha harvest wild populations, we have to consider more than just the demog demographic effects, and we need to consider the genetic effects as well. As well. And that doesn't mean that we have to change our management, because maybe in some situations, genetics is not going to make a difference. But I think we at least have to consider whether or not genetics, genetic effects are possible and try to implement them to minimize effects on productivity. I think that's, um, yeah, and so this is a nice, this is Colonel Walters at UBC, wrote this paper, <laughs> wrote a book on fisheries ecology and fish management. And you know, uh, my point was it can be difficult to convince managers, but actually I think the managers may be acting in a very rational way. So, <clears throat> so managers, if a population is over harvested, they can do two things in a simple world. They can curtail harvest or they can take no action. And so if they do curtail harvest, Everybody gets upset, mm -hmm. and it may not, might not work anyhow. Where if they do nothing, people are going to be much happier with them, and who knows, the population may recover anyhow. So, even though, so biologically, we might know the right thing to do, but when you try to apply that, that biology to policy, it becomes much, much more complicated, especially if it takes a long time to recover and sort of like the politicians worried about the next election, the manager is sort of mainly worried about his time period and his job. And so doing something is going to make the fish recover after he's out of his job. Less than so, now. so I'd be happy to answer your questions. I was just wondering, um, so I know what you're saying about genetics and you know, management accepting you know, genetics as a management principle. But if they know what they know about bighorn sheep, like even fish, you know, men over 15 inches in certain cases, how come, like for elk, you see everywhere where it's like brown time over? You know, so it's like, is there a I mean, it's about elk that they Gordon. He's the longest one. <laughs> but I mean, like, is there a reason why they, because I mean, clearly they, you know, acknowledge that because of the bighorn sheep, but it's like, I realize it would be tough, you know, you can't. Like the like right point of view, just go looking at an elk and saying, like, well, that's pushing the limit. But I mean, is there a reason that they have? I don't know. I was just wondering because it, it so, what, what exactly, like, what exactly like, is the question? It seems like they're asked, they're saying, go ahead and get the biggest bull you can as long as it's brown time only. So, I mean, yeah. like, just didn't know. Or do you address that? You think more about wildlife than I do, really. I think it's variable depending on the herd and the state, whether it's elk or bighorn, whether they consider, how much they consider selection pressure. That is, if they only allow really the largest horned or antlered individuals to be removed. But I do know Montana Fish Wildlife and Parks has reduced the intensity of selection on males so that they allow for a larger proportion of males per se. So they don't, they've reduced intensity in general on male harvest. I don't know so much about 
ampersands. Does, does anyone here know if there's a range of different ampersand regulations that exist? I can't imagine. I haven't heard of it. I do know there's it's different birds that have different horn size. And full curl is rare to allow rams to only allow hunting a full curl, but there are four fifths and three quarters. And three quarters was the harvest, it had to be at least three quarters curl before you could harvest a sheep or ram from Ram Mountain, that study from which the data come. Um, and there are, so that, and that's fairly common, but um, I think more common is becoming four fifth or larger horn before you can harvest it. So that's a stronger solution. Yeah. Um, and how are you supposed to tell 75% versus 80%? Right. Uh, of the size of the horn? Well, you said three quarters or four fifths, right? Yeah, yeah. That's 75 It's really large. Mm -hmm. You have to get a really good view of the side of the well, sheet yeah, multiple wrong. times, you draw a line across the eye and from the nose to through the eye. If it passes that, then you can shoot it. It's larger than that. Which I'm sure they all stop to do <laughs> before. Well, they shoot to get fined when they bring it in. But after you shoot it, if you go measure it, it's illegal. <laughs> Burn the body. <laughs> Yeah, so just put it in the lake, tie a brick to it. Yeah, I think generally, you know, it would, there would be some change in the horn size of actually harvest when you change the regulations for harvest. And then they also would have a limit in the total number allowed yeah, for a herd to be harvested. Right. And it was a pretty large proportion of the rams could be taken from Ram Mountain. So in a way, that's, that Ram Mountain herd is not typical. Um, there was a little stronger harvest there than in some herds. And it's also somewhat isolated. So if you think of gene flow as a mechanism of evolutionary change, and you only harvest one subpopulation in a metapopulation, you might be removing genes for large horns locally, but as long as there's connectivity and mm -hmm. gene flow coming back in, it may be less problematic. And that's been argued for that ram mountain herd is not being typical. <laughs>